so we're now going to transition to a panel about what's the future of the war in Ukraine. Uh, the, uh, the moderator is uh, our colleague Candice Rondo, who's a senior director of Future Frontlines and the Pl Planetary Politics Program. She's also got an uh, amazing new book about the Wagner Group that is going to be published uh, relatively soon. Thanks for the introduction. Appreciate it. It's great to be here. Um, I'm Candice Rondo, uh, as Peter just said, and we have with us today um, two extraordinary individuals uh, who have been working and looking at the question of Ukraine uh, for a very long time. Um, most importantly, um, we have Natalia coming to us from Ukraine, joining us live from the in field her <laughs> in her car, <laughs> the way it should be done, truly in style. Um, quickly, let me just introduce um, our, our guests and also sort of set the, set the scene a little bit and talk a little bit about what um, what the future of war is in Ukraine. Um, Evelyn Farkas is the executive director of the McCain Institute, and she brings deep expertise uh, for many, many years uh, working on the issue of Ukraine, Russia, European security, um, former deputy assistant secretary of defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. Um, there's nothing she doesn't know about foreign policy and national security when it comes to that region. Um, and Natalia Gumenyuk, is one of Ukraine's most insightful journalists and the founder and director of the Public Interest Journalism Lab. Um, and she's also a key partner in the Reckoning Project, something that we should all pay attention to. It's an initiative that is devoted to documenting war crimes uh, in Ukraine and bringing accountability uh, to uh, those who would act with impunity uh, in, in today's war. Um, we have a situation today, we're getting in two years now, uh, almost, a little bit more, obviously. We're creeping on three years uh, with this war in Ukraine. Uh, with this phase. With this phase of the war in Ukraine. <laughs> and um, we've seen some pretty big um, military challenges, diplomatic challenges. We've seen um, massive attacks, Russian attacks, missile attacks, particularly on Kharkiv, where Natalia was just um, spending some time. Um, we've seen an offensive in Kursk in the last month or so. Uh, a surprise offensive that I think took everybody uh, completely sort of off balance, especially the Russians. And we also have seen um, a lot of casualties, both civilian casualties and casualties on both sides uh, in terms of the military, some 545,000 uh, for the Russians and 200,000 for the Ukrainians. Um, but of course, the devastation in Ukraine is incalculable. So um, we've got 30 seconds, really, <laughs> to kind of get into this whole thing um, and, and uh, see if we can unpack uh, a little bit of what's happening. Natalia, I'm going to try and start with you. Um, you've been spending a lot of time on the front in Kharkiv, and um, you've also been writing and thinking about uh, the offensive in Kursk in the last little while. Um, can you set the scene a little bit and tell us sort of what's happening and sort of what impressions you have, A, of what's going on uh, in the Northeast, but also um, kind of the big picture. We've been talking a lot about uh, the challenges that uh, Putin now faces with the Kursk, Kursk offensive, but what does it mean strategically for Ukraine? And what, what are we missing from the analysis? Uh, hi, and uh, good to be with you. Uh, apology for being in the car. I'm on the way from Kharkiv, where I also was meeting to the soldiers and military, and there was no other way. Uh, but I do have a stable connection. Uh, so uh, I think the part which is missing is too much stress on the talks, on the negotiations, compared to how the Ukrainians are putting uh, this as you know part of the Ukrainian uh, war to defend its territory and more or less uh, find uh, the the military way uh, and solution for this conflict at least at this stage because uh, if if you describe the ukrainian strategy today is really not just like destroy russia no of course it's unfeasible it's not ever, it wasn't ever announced but the ukrainian idea is about to destroy russian capabilities to wage this type of the war uh, which is fight, which is fought against ukraine at this moment with that amount of people with that amount of weapon so the kursk offensive uh, happened to be maybe at the early stage even us in ukraine a bit underestimated its importance but uh, it indeed uh, was a bit of the turning point to show that it's not exactly just about the stalemate. It's uh, really, you know, about the destructing uh, the Russian forces, but also not letting them 
to wage the offensive war like it was in the region near Kharkiv and near Sumy. I'm speaking about far away distant places, but we, sp we know that this year uh, the Russians started the uh, new assault in the north of the country, which was successfully stopped. Yes, the fightings are going on in the Donbas, but to be honest, they are not that significant. Of course, for a soldier, I talked to a few, you know, losing a 50 meters where probably this person lost his fellows and you know risk his life is is, is really precious but uh, for ukraine it's it's a difficult decisions uh, to um, to do that but it's still the part of the bigger plan because this year in particularly in 2024 uh, we were thinking that this is a year where russia could use the pause with the weapon delivery to develop even bigger and stronger militarized army, you know, to uh, get more uh, allies or wherever you call them who will uh, give the weapon to them. I would speak about Iran, I would speak about uh, North Korea, to redevelop with a new minister of defense in Russia to uh, reorganize their economy so they would be able even, uh, you know, use more weapon, develop more weapon and uh, push more, but uh, slowing down Russia at this particular moment when they also needed the change and exhausting them uh, really matter for Ukraine. So I think that the stalemate, which is often the, the war as a state stalemate, which is often described as such, is part of the mistake because you know defending uh, the land and defending the life and. Uh, fighting in a way that and defending the country protecting the cities and keeping the life as normal as possible to extend is possible is actually the strategic win so the whole rephrasing and the uh, of of, of uh, you know getting out of the idea of the stalemate or attrition war as just the attrition war for ukraine is probably would be what i would call the uh, the something which is missing do you think there's something missing? I mean, uh, Natalia raises a, a few good points. You know, one, just sort of, um, we're not in a stalemate, actually. We see this right. a very fluid situation. What's your, what's your take? I mean, I think, broadly speaking, it looks like a stalemate because the change, certainly, in the Donbass is incremental. And it's creeping, and it is attrition warfare at the end of the day. The Russians have, you know, either three to one or ten to one manpower and, and munition advantage against the Ukrainians. So it doesn't look good from that perspective. But um, I think the, the launch into, uh, into the Kursk region was clearly an effort to change the dynamic, to, make, to take the offensive, to take the initiative, to make it not just about attrition warfare. Of course, the Ukrainians have to hang in there. Um, but to, you know, essentially change the, the, the dynamic by saying, okay, we're going to take this new territory. Now they've managed to hold on to it, so that's a tactical and an operational victory so far. But can they convert it to a strategic win? Because ultimately it seems, while they did get some prisoner exchange, and that's maybe more strategic because it, 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 boosts, it gives a boost to the Ukrainian will, and certainly the, from the Western perspective or, or in terms of the Western will, we also responded favorably so far. But the real strategic gain for Ukraine will be if they can, can convert that at the end of this long war to a peace that is more advantageous to Ukraine. So whereby they swap this Russian territory. So they actually need to hold on to it. Um, and so that is something that over time could become more of a challenge for them though they've surprised all of us by holding on to it. But we can't forget that Vladimir Putin doesn't care of, about the Russian lives. <laughs> and so if he decides he wants to take Kursk back, I don't think, you know, many people think, oh, he might not bomb his own people. Yes, he could bomb his own people. Of course, it does contain some risk for him, much more risk than bombing the Chech Chechens and Chechnya. But it's not, it's not something that you can dismiss readily. So the Russians could try to take that territory back. Um, but I do think that the game right now that the Ukrainians are trying to pl play is to keep the Russians off balance. They're also continuing, I mean, we're not reading about it in the front page of the New York Times, but there was another attack on a munitions depot, I believe it was yesterday. So every day they're trying to take out the really critical military or civil military infrastructure in the, in the rear of the Russian front lines. And that is also something that over time could be strategic. Certainly it's, it has operational impact.
So that, I mean, this is a good segue, and I'll, I'll come to you, Natalia, about this. Um, obviously, biggest debate going on forever and ever is um, what the White House will and will not do vis-a-vis uh, uh, the use of American weapons, and then also NATO partners. But I think what we see now is an emergence of a split um, between the United States and Europe. Uh, Joseph Burrell, just about 10 days ago, uh, the top diplomat for the EU, um, said he thinks it's time. Uh, it's time for uh, the NATO partners to lift these restrictions on the use of missiles, um, empower the Ukrainians to do what they need to do to change the dynamic, uh, and get to the negotiating table faster and, and reduce the number of uh, civilian deaths and the destruction there. So Natalia, you know, I'll turn to you with this question. Uh, you, you're, you've been to Kharkiv, uh, you see Kursk. What would happen if, in fact, let's say in December or January, after the election when things are a little bit more clear you know, here in the United States, uh, what would happen if those rules change, if the restrictions were lifted? What kind of contingencies should uh, Ukrainians be thinking about and what will it mean for European security? So, first of all, Ukrainians are, you know, boosting the morale, all the good things. Uh, they're very important. They're important for the troops. But for Ukrainians, with such operation, it's really more pragmatic, sometimes tactical, sometimes strategic. So, for instance, it's not just really holding to this territory, because in the long run, Ukrainians won't need the Russian territory. Yes, we can speak about the swap, but that's something potential. At this stage, it's really about, you know, cutting the supply lines, and things like that, stopping the assault from the north for uh, two of the Ukrainian regions. And I'm clo and I'm coming to the uh, you know um, lifting the restrictions about uh, using the weapon long range. There are also uh, a lot of practicalities. Recently, we we already understand that there is a limit to the air defense Ukraine can get. But also, as a Ukrainian citizen as well, I know uh, pretty well by this now having the air sirens on my phone, am I in Kiev, in, in, in Kharkiv, uh, you know, ringing all the time, that there is a very clear timing for the Ukrainian air defense to understand, uh, you know, uh, when the Russian um, plane is on the air. And the further they are, you know, uh, that's easier. So. At, at this moment, you know, it may take like five minutes or, you know, even less for Ukrainian air defense to identify the, the target. If they would know that they are on the uh, distance, uh, which is not out of reach for the Ukrainians, probably they would move these uh, bases with the aircraft way further. And what I understand from some of the Ukrainian military analysts that uh, Ukrainian, you know, would have like minutes and minutes and 20 minutes, even more uh, to identify and which would which would mean way less strikes against Ukraine. But also such even more things, you know, you, we can discuss can Ukraine win. But for instance, if the carriage bridge doesn't exist, you know, if it's at least in shambles or something happens to it, uh, there are less chances that Russia can win and can go on because still the Crimea, and now we also speak about Crimea more, uh, not in terms of the you know history or uh, human rights uh, which are violated there, but as a military point through which the weapon is coming to Ukraine uh, from Russia, that definitely, you know, absence of this bridge definitely won't uh, allow if it's the, if it's not there the russia probably won't be able to to win as we saw in the black sea you know pushing the the russian ships closer to the russian borders um, you know uh, enabled uh, security for a lot of ukrainian southern towns so uh, there is a strategic thing. Yes, it's not like one minute all of a sudden Ukraine has it and Ukraine wins. But there are very, very practical, uh, connected to geography, connected to military strategy things. And believe me, uh, when we, you know, it's not like we're talking to the Russian soldiers, but we talk to uh, and we try to analyze what's there. Uh, I don't really, do we know that Russians think that some of the weapon isn't used? You know, for them, the red lines was pushed so many times and the the truth is they're escalating anyways and the escalation is not that much connected to what is given by the ukrainians but some a lot of a lot of other factors which uh, are not really connected with those restrictions 
So that's a good point. So several points have been made here. One, the red lines that Putin has set down uh, continually seem to blur. Uh, they move, they're all over the place, uh, and he seems unable to respond. And I'd like to note that we've seen in the last year a major purge of his defense ministry, uh, in large part in response to the mutiny uh, with the Wagner Group last year. So you know, he's, he's definitely down several chips. Yes. Uh, but Natalia also points out something I think that's very interesting I hadn't thought about, which is um, just the, the mere fact of being able to reach a little bit further, not even firing, but actually having that reach will ultimately force the Russians to move back from the front lines. I mean, that, that is a real effect, uh, and we've seen that in the case of the, the Black Sea. Uh, we've seen that all, all over sort of southeastern uh, Ukraine. So what would you say to that? Well, okay, so the administration says, well, they're firing from the Arctic Circle. So I think there are two, there are two components of this issue. One is the air defense. The air defense is something that Ukraine has been crying for since day one, and they need help with this. They need it for their civilians in the cities and the towns. They need it on the front line. And I believe it sounds like the administration and our allies are focused on that, and they will be doing something to help there, but it's never enough. And so air defense is number one, still number one. The long-range strike capability. What I'm hearing, so, it, so on the one hand, yes, you know, Joseph Burrell, others in Europe, and even in the US have said, okay, look what Ukraine did. They took the initiative in Kursk. Now they have the initiative. Now that the momentum's with them, we should really you know, eliminate the restrictions we placed on the use of long-range weaponry. So that, that, that's one argument out there. But then you see the administration hesitating, continuing to hesitate, saying that they don't have sufficient long-range stripe capabilities, so munitions that they can give the Ukrainians to sustain a barrage. That, and I am not a military expert, so, but it does lead me to think, okay, so if you're not sustaining a barrage, maybe you take out the Kursk Bridge, maybe there are things you can do to combine your arms and very strategically use a few of the longer range strike munitions, perhaps to strike fear <laughs> into, into the Russians and m force them to move back. But my understanding is that the administration is pretty strongly dug in right now, saying that they don't think it would be a game changer necessarily. And then we just heard from the German chancellor, you know, we want peace, we want peace. Of course, the Russian government is not ready for peace. <laughs> so, you know, as much as we want peace, and Zelensky will say the Russians can come to the next peace, you know, set of peace talks, they are not, they're not ready for peace, so there won't be peace. Unfortunately, for now, the battlefield has to be shaped further, and the political environment has to be shaped further, and the economic environment <laughs> needs to be shaped further to incentivize the Russians to actually sit at the negotiating table in a serious fashion. So maybe these long-range strike munitions can be used, again, very cleverly, very strategically. But if you're talking about sort of taking it all out, apparently, that's not going to that's not, that's not an option. I, I don't know the, the truth of all that, again, because I'm not a military expert, but we do have a problem in terms of manufacturing capability. Now, the other part of this, and I think this might be why the German chancellor suddenly you know, came out with a comment about peace when he was on uh, German television, is because there have been increased um, accidents, you know, the drones falling into, or at least increased attention to them. Uh, maybe it's not an increase, actually, in the number, but drones and, and destroyed drones falling in Romania and Poland. I know at one point the Polish government wanted to actually position their Patriot batteries inside of Ukraine mm -hmm. so they could defend their territory better and it would have the added benefit of, of, of covering, I think, Lviv. They could open an airport. Um, so there are things that we could also do to help Ukraine be more strategic. And the European allies, I think, are getting nervous. And I think that's why they're searching for something. Because every day that this war goes on, you just continue to increase the risk that inadvertently somehow NATO has to respond with force. You saw the Latvians when the, they found, I think it was also a drone in their territory, or maybe it escaped from their territory. But there was a drone that overflew Latvia, and the Latvian government said, Nothing was hurt, <laughs> you know. Well, one of these days, something's gonna get hurt, a building or a person. We saw it already in Poland. It was relatively small damage. But um, if we have something serious like that, then NATO will feel challenged. And, you know, Article 5, I mean, it's, it's a demonstration of political will. So to back down uh, might be really problematic for NATO. 
All right, there are a lot of things I want to unpack here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, just, I want to sort of add in a, just a little bit of sort of um, commentary and maybe some analysis. So, so first of all, let's let's talk a little bit about um, this challenge with you know spillover, right? Uh, that you've just talked about in Poland, Romania. Uh, we see Moldova also kind of complaining about this potentiality. Um, but let's be real, Germany doesn't have the money. Uh, one of the biggest motivations for Olaf Scholz uh, to say what he said is that you know, 2025, they're falling off a cliff with their defense budget. Um, and this is largely, again, comes back to the same fundamental question that NATO has been wrestling with for a very long time, uh, which is just the political will to keep up your 2%, uh, which now really is not really a peg. I mean, we really need to be at 3%. So that's, that's one point to, to sort of point out is that, you know, it's convenient timing to sort of be alarmed about this when you know that you have a cliff fall in your budget. Um, and that's something that I think Europeans are gonna have to wrestle with. Uh, let me also just offer this comment. Let's imagine that um, the government of, of Volodymyr Zelensky is decapitated. What is the response of NATO in that instance? Is there any choice other than to respond with some sort of conventional arms? Probably not. Mm -hmm. So. At what point do we stop with incrementalism and move to a point where we can enable the Ukrainians to do what they need to do, not for a total win, but for a negotiating position of strength? That's a very big question for us, right? And so that brings us to the question of, of you know, peace negotiations. Um, we've seen recently, obviously, uh, Zelensky had his event in uh, Switzerland. Um, we've seen some visits from uh, Narendra Modi. We've seen conversations between Zelensky uh, and Xi Jinping. It, so clearly there's an attempt to um, begin conversations, although obviously, as you say, uh, I think we all know Vladimir Putin is in no way uh, in, the, in the mood for a conversation. Uh, for him, negotiation means the end of his term, and he has not yet resolved the fundamental problem of the ultranationalists who are barking at the moon right now uh, because of what's going on in Kursk and because of what's happened uh, most recently with the mutiny last year uh, with the Wagner Group. So, um, Natalia, I'm gonna come to you and ask you for your perspective on uh, Zelensky's peace plan, but also uh, a little bit on sort of these third parties, third party actors like Modi who are offering themselves up as, as potential brokers. Um, is that real? Um, is there any third party broker out there that has any credibility or th can move things in a direction? Uh, a couple of points, and of course I'll get to that. So first, you, you mentioned the money, but I think it's very important to understand the deterrence cost less than doing something after something is destroyed, which was, for instance, given the example of the power grid. So if somebody is speaking about the lack of the money, we know that it's better to pay now and later it would be anyway longer. You mentioned shortly, you know, what if, I understand it's very theoretical, that the Zelensky government is captivated. For me, for the Ukrainian, it's quite an interesting to hear. That would be a different person elected, and I don't think that would be a change. For us, it's just like an official, Zelensky is an elected official, and a different person would be appeared. And he's pretty representative of the Ukrainian public opinion. But you speaking about the negotiations. So uh, I think that there is no uh, now a discussion about the third party brokers. Uh, the Ukrainian idea of the peace formula is to engage way more countries, um, a lot of countries, but, you know, a lot of partners, but on the principal matters and uh, suggesting a different offers. Somebody would agree on uh, nuclear, uh, somebody would speak about the human rights or environment, and if you really don't want to deal with the security, you are not there. Uh, with with uh, India, the Ukrainian task was really at least, if not force India to be, uh, you know, from, you know, move from Russia, but at least move a bit in the Ukrainian direction and get to the idea of the uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity. The same is discussed with uh, China uh, because there was a bit of the movement. And for Ukraine, it's not really, you know, the discussion with China is not about like, we are agreeing that you are a broker between us and uh, and Russia. For that, we have the peace formula. Can you join in any way in the position you want? It's more like, can you guarantee that you do not uh, use, uh, th that you don't give uh, the weapon to Russia and technology? Can you at least guarantee that Russia is not using nuclear? So there are very pragmatic particular things which Ukraine wants and maybe partially play. So for instance, India is looking how China is 
trying to become you know bigger in this in this game and then you can balance because india is not interested in uh strengthening china so so it's it's when we see these things for ukraine it's really keeping off uh, the balance uh so it's not shifting and you know for instance that even in, inside the brics there is more discussion and rather than brics is becoming the instrument of russia and things like that uh that's how i think we would see this negotiation and yes uh, there are no signs uh, of vladimir putin uh willing to negotiate at this time and when a lot of articles appeared as long as there's a break there are the articles appearing i'm trying to focus to understand what's going on and there are just not no signals and of course ukrainians at this stage won't trust uh any non genuine uh and uh, not realistic uh negotiations because the understanding is in that case it gives the russia the moment to strengthen its economy to strengthen its uh you know military uh, industrial complex in the moment when ukraine probably would get less and less uh military aid from the west and things like that uh so uh but what i worry the less is that it matters for vladimir putin in one day vladimir putin won't tell we succeeded we did what we wanted we pacified ukraine we showed them uh what we can do you know uh, as even you mentioned prigozhin you know it happened as if nothing happened as if there was no attempt to so i do not think I, 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 you know for russian moving out the troops uh there, there are other reasons why they are doing that but if the decision is made in kremlin to do differently Uh, I, I would claim they can afford that. Do you have a take on this? I'm not sure I followed exactly the argument. So, so I think three three arguments were made. One, Vladimir Putin is not negotiating. Right. Um, two, it's got to be the forum or nothing, um, and that China and India are really sort of really jockeying with each other yeah. over sort of bigger picture issues, yeah. sort of where they sit. uh in the world order and they're and they're kind of evolving growing uh, i would say influence in in world affairs and so that ukraine is a little bit more of this kind of peace in their minds um but as as natalia was saying uh there's also you know with with g in particular uh there's a there's a real strong sort of tactical need to get a guarantee on the the restraints on nuclear use right so i think you know the big picture is um nobody's serious yet but um there's a need for seriousness. Yeah, I mean I don't disagree with any of that. Um as I said before, Vladimir Putin is not ready for negotiation. Uh, the obvious thing that none of us said is of course he's waiting for US elections. Um and he can wait till November 5th uh and then wait and see what will happen. Um he's banking on uh, you know ultimately that the West will grow weary. I think regardless of what happens in our elections but a gift to him would be having Donald Trump back in the White House because because of Trump's attitude towards him and the war. Um the the I mean I think the China India, you know, I don't think that I I don't think that's that important except that it showcases how clever <laughs> the President Zelensky has been. at not letting himself become isolated diplomatically keeping the door open to countries like India um playing a constructive role and even China when it comes to the nuclear issue so i think that that just leaves some options open the options have yet to be exercised so we'll see how it works out in the end maybe there's some role for india in the final negotiations um to counterbalance china um who knows you know if they do a big contact group at the end you could see diplomatically something for india in that but uh i think the real game the real question in the near to medium term is what will china do militarily and economically to help or not help russia because there's increasing pressure being put on china by us and by our european allies they're providing precursor materials to the russians of course the drones all of those things that they're providing to the russians all along dual use capabilities uh, get very close to providing munitions to them and so uh i think the chinese have been hesitant to cross a line with us and our allies because she still understands he needs to have some kind of economy some kind of you know economic prospect for his people although there's a lot of pressure on him on that 
um, and he doesn't seem like a you know red-blooded capitalist um, when it comes down to it. Um, but he does understand the dynamic. He needs to kind of maintain a, a healthy economy. So I, I think that's the real question, that what will China do? And if it looks like Russia is losing, you know, will China step in? China doesn't really care. She has a good relationship with Vladimir Putin. We know that. But at the end of the day, what China wants is a, a friendly neighbor. They want a friendly Russia. Whether it's run by Vladimir Putin or someone else doesn't matter as long as it's friendly towards China and not friendly towards the United States and the West, or at least, you know, again, very much allied with China. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, but I also think they want, they want a a Russia that um, feels that it has achieved its economic ends. Uh, there is an interlinkage between uh, their economies uh, that we can't forget about, and that's really important. And I would say that you know, with drones, satellite technology, um, all the other sort of you know, uh, dual use materials, they're edging very very close now, uh, right. right right to the edge, yeah. uh, to the point where. The next administration, no matter whether it's Trump or uh, uh, Vice President Harris, uh, is going to really have to grapple with this. So uh, let me let me talk about that a little bit and see if we can kind of pull that out. And I also want to make sure we get a chance for uh, audience questions. But you know, everybody assumes that Donald Trump, when he comes to office, it'll be sort of you know tap turned off. We're done with Ukraine. Uh, he himself has said uh, he can solve the the conflict in one day. Good luck with that. Uh, on the other hand, I think we also hear from Vice President Harris uh, kind of more of the same. Uh, you know, and this is the challenge that I think she faces as a candidate still kind of in the, in the in incumbent role, is distinguishing herself from uh, the current administration without alienating, obviously, uh, the constituency that uh, the Biden administration has built. So tough, a very tough situation. And yet, um, January 20, 2025 will come. Uh, it, it will be a day of reckoning. It will be the beginning of something, even if it's going to be sort of a messy beginning of something. Uh, and I don't think we're going to see, uh, you know, a complete wind down of Ukrainian aid. I just, I don't see it. Uh, I, I don't, I think a lot of this depends on Congress uh, and, of course, the uh, Defense Authorization Act. So let me turn to you quickly and, and get your take on sort of, all right, we don't have an instant wind down, but we do, we are maybe looking at a two year cliff fall. Um, what can be achieved in that time from a US perspective, a NATO perspective, quickly enough to position Ukraine uh, so that it has a better negotiating position? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, we need to have a strategy that involves the Ukrainians and our European allies. I would prefer that we remove all the restrictions that we placed on the Ukrainians and let them just fight this war so that they can prevail, so that they have a strong position at the negotiating table. We know that they don't want to conquer Russia. You know, we know that they their aim is to restore their sovereignty, and we support that. And I will say that um, President Biden's been a little bit more, he, in a recent statement he said, we will um, be with Ukraine until uh, Ukraine prevails, I think was the word. I think that um, Vice President Harris, there are signs that she could be tougher um, because she has that prosecutor perspective, because she's dealt with bullies like Putin. You know, um, So she may be tougher. She may be tougher with sanctions. She may be tougher or less afraid of taking on the risk of standing up to Putin by saying to the Ukrainians, we gave you the equipment. It's your war. Go fight it. Um, we know you're going to obey the laws of war. We know you're going to pay attention to human rights and civilians. Keep doing that, and we support you. I think that this incremental support and this cautious approach that we've taken, um, you know, it, we've held the line. But if we really want Ukraine to win, we have to do more. And so that's what I would hope would happen in January 2025, if not sooner, that we and the allies decide, OK, enough is enough. We need to help the Ukrainians help themselves. The other part of it, of course, is um, indigenous Ukrainian defense mm. um, capabilities. And there may be ways that we can incentivize and work with our European allies to help the Ukrainians build up their own defense capability. That's going to be a big one. Um, so Natalia, I, I want to turn that question to you, but I also want to ask you a little bit about the most recent cabinet shakeup uh, that Volodymyr uh, Zelensky just undertook. We have a new uh, foreign minister, uh, Andriy Sibiha, uh, somebody who's not as well known, of course, as uh, Dmitry uh, Kuleba, but of course, equally respected. Give us a sense of sort of what that shakeup means uh, for um, just people in, in Ukraine, what people are sort of saying, and also what it might mean for the future relationship between the United States and Ukraine. 
Well, br briefly, uh, w would answer on the, uh, you know, what was said earlier. So yes, developing the Ukrainian defense capabilities is, is really exactly Ukraine is looking uh, at and looking for. I, I, I've just had a chance to really chat to a group of the soldiers who are fighting in the front line, uh, like yesterday. And they clearly said, like, on the talk that, like, they don't expect any foreign troops. They just need what they need. Uh, and that's in everybody's interests. And it's like they treat this war as the work, the hard work. And despite being tired, they just need to go on. Uh, and, 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 and that is uh, the mood. And it's, it's really not about, I'm probably repetitive, like, destroying the Russia but just guaranteeing that there won't be any repetition of that type of the full-scale invasion in the years. So there is something. So it's more feasible. But as about the government reshuffle, uh, yes, it is. It's quite a big. Uh, and um, uh, it, uh, I won't say that it was fully unexpected. Uh, with some minister, yes. With some minister, don't. I had a chance to be at the briefing with uh, Andriy Sabihev, with a number of the experts and journalists uh, a few days before, a day after he was uh, voted for. Uh, so uh, he insisted that there won't be a change in the foreign policy, policy and maybe there would be just a different tools in the way it would be, uh, you know, implemented. Uh, there would be more strengthening of the, you know, some of the embassies they want to strengthen. So there is a part of the things uh, they want he's responsible to deal with the Ukrainians abroad because there are millions and millions of the Ukrainians abroad who uh, also need kind of consular help and there, are, there would be, a, you know, it's part of the task of Ukrainians to return these Ukrainians to back home and to have better connection. Uh, but it's a lot about the defense, about the U.S., transatlantic, but also the peace formula. He, he really insisted on that, but meaning the broader connection. So uh, he was uh, earlier from the very first day working uh, in the similar, in, in, the, in the capacity of the, uh, of the deputy, deputy head of the president administration also in charge with a lot connected to the foreign relations. So he was like very, very much insider. Um, and uh, so, so that would be some particular coherence. Also, he was even bigger insider to Zelensky team in this regard. Uh, and is kind of considered like a top uh, manager. Uh, so this is like about the practicalities, but ensure that uh, nothing uh, strategically won't change, but of course, uh, doing a lot around the uh, U.S. elections to extend Ukraine can do. But by this, I mean like uh, explaining itself, ex uh, trying to, to reach out, trying to stay bipartisan to navigate. Uh, that's also also would be a part of the priority for Ukraine. Absolutely. Well, I think we have time um, for audience questions, uh, if there are any. I see a couple. Wow, a few. <laughs> um, do we have the mic runner here? Um, why don't we take um, this young woman in the front here? Did you call me young? Yes, I did. <laughs> I'm always going to call you young. <laughs> Sorry, second question of the day um, to Evelyn. Uh, I haven't seen you in a while either. Um, um, so um, I run a company called Global Foresight Strategies where we are looking at uh, Ukraine through the prism of a larger strategic confrontation between authoritarian and dem democratic um, governments. And I feel in a lot of our conversations around the tactical, uh, you know, important issues of pushing Russia back and air defense and military requirements that we're kind of missing some of the more extremely important issues like the toxic poison of disinformation that is very much targeted at specific political elements, not just in the US, but across Europe. And that's sort of the, the shaky ground that's evolved. Um, I don't know how much any of you, including Natalia, have really um, thought about what real solutions we have in our democratic societies around that, but I would love to hear if you, if you have, because it's such the, I guess, the, um, the strategic poison of what could play out in the next few years. That's a great question, and I just want to point out that um, just a couple days ago, the Department of Justice um, issued charges against uh, a number of Russian uh, GRU agents uh, involved in spreading disinformation. If you have not read the exhibits that they submitted, um, I really encourage you to do so. It is extremely eye-opening in terms of 
um, their, their goals for electing um, far right wing extremists with traditional family values. Um, we're in a serious situation. Uh, and you know, the, the Russians have demonstrated uh, a, a will and a capability uh, unlike really any other other than China, I would say. What, what's your take on it? Yeah, and I would just add, I, I was recently on CNN, um, Jake Tapper did a segment on this, but he focused on the fact that the Russians now are very, uh, you know, very deliberately supporting um, right, uh, so right wing or, you know, right of center uh, podcasters um, and other individuals to, to advance a narrative that is against U.S. and allied support for Ukraine. So in addition to everything else that they, all their other objectives, you know, fomenting um, all kinds of polarization in our countries, supporting right wing or, you know, populist candidates, um, they also are now deliberately trying to impact the perspective of our people with regard to Ukraine. Um, so I, I, I think that's an issue. I also have to plug <laughs> the McCain Institute. We, we, are, we have a task force on disinformation. I think, Candace, you've been involved in many of our activities. Later this month, we're putting out a report that will give some recommendations, state, federal, and local level, to include for journalists. But I mean, I think it would be great to hear what a journalist like Natalia thinks we can do. Um, so first of all, um, I think that there should be differentiation. There are particular countries like Ukraine, and Ukraine is democracy, and I'm of course for all kind of the freedoms. But uh, the authoritarian regimes use one toolkit, uh, you know, one can in the democracies, and a different like inside of Russia. So for instance, we would differentiate in Ukraine the disinformation, the weird argument, conspiratorial thinking, and using the you know calls for genocide calls for killing ukrainians and you know creating the system which enables the murders of the ukrainians in different projects and working on the documentation of the war crimes and we can particularly connect how you know the russian propagandistic television is really enabling murdering the people and and like there i think that there should be some criminal responsibility for some of the uh, you know publication or the leaders uh, and that's also very important but in the democratic societies using their own media even in ukraine at this stage of the 30th of, of the war russia is trying you know to be more subversive uh, and what they are doing they finding the vulnerable groups uh, and the vulnerabilities of these societies they really working on the you know conspiratorial thinking and it would be in the u.s but we know how much uh, after all the restrictions they invested to south uh, America, to Africa, to a lot of other countries. And they are very, very, very much targeting the, you know, uh, every country and every particular group. So it would be different for left wing. It would be different for far right. It would be uh, different for, you know, people who are concerned about, you know, vaccines or, or things like that. And uh, for, for us, it's very important, like, to have a proper research, to identify to, to really accept that there is no one remedy and different shape. What is crime is a crime. If it's in case of Ukraine, you know, we would, you know, investigate the propaganda as a use of the tool of war. But in, in, in a different societies, you know, be cautious, but also not to allowing these uh, kind of messages to become normalized. And uh, that is a, you know, that is a big, big, big problem when something which we couldn't think about a few years ago is becoming, you know, a norm for, uh, for public conversation. And there where, where we start. Uh, being very cautious about particular digital tools, but it's too long to start. Uh, but but I, I do think this, uh, this is already about the particular knowledge and particular technology. So I think we have time, I think, for a couple more questions. Are we good to go? One, maybe one more question? All right. Uh, I'm going to... I like your blue shirt, so but, <laughs> nothing against your shirt, but I like your blue shirt. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jack Kropansky, unaffiliated. Um, has Ukraine gotten all of the aid that had been promised last year, last fall, that was held up in Washington? Is that gotten through to the front? Do they have all the artillery shells that Europeans had promised? Or what, what is it that they critically need over the next six months to uh, stay in the fight? Good question. Uh, I suspect no, but. Yeah, and I think <laughs> Natalia might have much more information than myself um, firsthand. But um, I mean, the answer is no, I know, because on the air defense, remember, they announced a certain number of systems, which I don't recall the exact figure, but it was double digits. 
Uh, and I know that they're readying one going over there very soon from an allied country. So uh, that tells me they're not all in there. And of course, uh, it's clear that we don't have enough air defense. And I haven't seen a significant uptick in terms of protection for the Ukrainians. Uh, so my suspicion is that those Patriot systems are not all in there. And certainly all of the ammunition, everything, I mean, that was never intended to be sent to them all at the same time. Um, but uh, they, I, it sounds like, and again, Natalia would have more fresh information, but just the more recent reporting from CNN and the New York Times uh, talking about demoralization on the front, it's unclear to me whether when they talk about rationing the munitions that that's looking back or whether they're still doing it. And they probably are still doing it because of what I mentioned before, the three to one or 10 to one you know, imbalance um, differentiation ratio between the Ukrainians and the Russians. Right. Or the other way around. Uh, okay. So the first probably would be the delay between the announcement and the time when something is arrived can be a year. It's as long. And for such a, you know, intense war, it's just too long. And yes, what I understand, quite a few things uh, are far from, from there. Given your example on the air defense, of course, it's, it's reasonable to say that it's never enough. But I remember the discussion when, Pol when it was said that you know, Poland, a country of the size of Ukraine, requested up like for further, like 25 Patriot system, which would be enough to defend the country. At that time, Ukraine has around like eight. Oh, no, 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 not even eight, like maybe way less, but we speak at about a dozen of them. So you just understand that for a country fighting the war, it's it's few times less. Uh, but as about the morale, I remember the conversation last February, you know, when I talked to the military and they told like that at one battle, the military was yelling in Avdivka. Uh, but people were yelling not because you know it was dangerous, but because they did, they ran out of the ammunition and they couldn't fight back. It's a bit different. It's became better since spring, but Ukrainians, you know, it's not perfect. I won't ever say that our army is perfect. They do they do as much as they can, but the whole thinking is about being rational with the limited resources using less, using in a smart way. That's why, by the way, uh, you know, uh, Ukrainians are, 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 you know, trying to be more precise with their strikes. I'm not saying that they are not missing targets or they are not losing some of the drones, but the longer we fight, we do understand that it's very, very, you know, practical. And even if you're very, very smart, there is a moment when quantity becomes the quality and that's of course what Russians are fighting so far Ukraine still try to fight like with the quality against the quantity yeah big differences there and I'll just say I mean, you think about sort of Afghanistan versus Ukraine just um, you know they're not comparable necessarily but there are a lot of things uh, I think you know this rationing is going to be sort of a feature of the war for a long time to come uh, and it underscores the point that this is not over yet uh, most importantly so Natalia thank you uh, for everything that you're doing, for taking the time. Please stay safe, and I hope to connect with you again soon. And Evelyn, thank you for joining us.